Hi, this is James Jude Courtney, Michael Myers in Halloween 2018, soon to be released Halloween Kills and Halloween Ends, and you're watching Slasher Pepper. Enjoy. <laughs> hey guys, Slasher Pepper, and welcome to another video. Today I have another interview, this time with James Jude Courtney, Michael Myers himself in the 2018 Halloween film, and soon to be seen in Halloween Kills and Ends. How are you doing? Doing great, man. How y'all doing? Awesome. Glad to have you on the show. Yeah, yeah. Glad to be here, man. Glad we got to you know, finally work it out. It took a little while, but... Yeah, yeah, here. yeah. <laughs> took a couple of uh, months, actually. <laughs> That's the way stuff rolls, man. Crazy times. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, let's hope um, this all settles sooner rather than later. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. But I think, you know, it's, it, honestly, for, for me, it's been a, a, a time of introspection, sort of a forced sabbatical, like... So I've gotten to look at creatively, like how I live my life and where I want my career to go and where I want my spiritual life to grow and, you know, like uh, looking at relationships. And so it hasn't been easy, but it's been a, it's been a really, it's been a really good time and, you know, sort of mapping out the future. And even though Halloween is, you know, the release of Halloween Kills is being, you know, pushed back a year, that really gives us all time to, you know, sort of reflect on our lives and see where we want to go with it. And I think the fans, you know, the safety of the fans was most important. That was one of the most important things they talked about when we talked about not releasing it. So a, a tough time, but I think it's going to be a really important time for all of us. Oh yeah. Yeah. You should make the best of it for yourself now. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely. unexpected. But if you, if you, you know, like you said, just self-reflection, um, you got all the time for that right now. Yeah, it's crazy. And, and you know, what I find very interesting is, is being able to really stop and look at the relationships we have, the people, you know, finding a little gratitude for whatever it is in our lives, because no matter how good or bad it is, there's always something really, you know, that we have to be grateful for. And so if we stop for a second and look around and go, you know, we're pretty doggone lucky people, man. Yeah. Anybody who's watching this, anybody who's sitting in these rooms knows that no matter how tough it is, we're lucky to be here. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like the, the chance of becoming, even becoming a human person is so small. Like you could have been a tree. I mean, how boring would that be, right? You know, we're, <laughs> right? we're human beings. So the, <laughs> right? we have Especially so many opportunities. Some knucklehead wants to chop down. I mean, that's <laughs> <laughs> You can't do anything about it. You can't just punch him and be like, hey, don't chop me down. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, honestly, you know, it's, it's great you put, point that out because I think being alive at this time, I think this is one of the most pivotal times in human history. Oh yeah. I think we're going to see such so much radical change. We're finally realizing that we're all brothers and sisters, you know, and, and, and so I think there's a lot of, especially your generation and the generations behind you, like the really, really like the young kids who are not even aware yet. I mean, I think there's a lot of people who are coming up and going, wait a minute, these are my brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter what country, it doesn't matter what religion, it doesn't matter right. what sexual orientation, like we're all brothers and sisters. So like brothers and sisters. I mean, I have six younger brothers, man. We used to fight like dogs. I mean, just like <laughs> beat each other. To, I'm bloody. I mean, dents in cars and crazy stuff. But at the end of the day, when the shit hit the fan, my brothers and I closed like an artichoke around the heart. And so, you know, at the end of the day, when things got tough in our family, we could sit down and go, okay, guys, we're brothers, man. I mean, you know, we, we got to work this out. And I think we're at that place right now in our society. And, and you know, I think it's really great that, for me, horror... I mean, I've done cons around the world, and, and what I find is horror fans are the nicest people on the planet. For they sure. They are. And you have people from every walk of life, every imaginable looking, sounding, you know, wealth levels and religions and everything, but they all get along and they're all courteous and they're all, you know, kind, compassionate people. And I think, you know, and I said this before, is like, if horror cons, if the world operated like a horror con, we wouldn't need military. I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's so true. And it's interesting. I think that, you know, they, I think that, that, that we who enjoy horror, I think there's, I, I, haven't, I haven't talked to a psychiatrist or a psychologist about this, but I have the sense that horror fans work out their path though subconsciously by immersing themselves in horror. And so the, all that crap is worked out and they don't have to run around being knuckleheads in the streets, you know, and, and being angry and violent. And Oh, know, yeah. You know what I mean? I think about it that way as well. And um, for me personally, I also listen to heavy metal. So if I'm angry, I'll either watch just like a horror movie or listen to heavy metal and then it's done. And then 
I'm back as usual, like um, yeah, you Happy Roger, out. you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I've done a lot of martial arts and boxing and stuff, man, hitting heavy bags, just getting out and working a bag or, you know, getting in. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't spar anymore, but, you know, getting in and sparring would work it out. That just, you know, and you find, for instance, I'm, a lot of my friends are world champion fighters and um, guys I've had the, the privilege of training with and, you know, friends who served in special forces, working out with those guys. Those guys are the nicest freaking guys you'll ever meet, you know? Right. They get to work the shit out in the ring and then be nice guys and, you know, at home. Yeah, and that's, that's a good way to, to get rid of that anger because no one wants to hear you complain about it. So, so why not complain against, against like a boxing uh, thing, <laughs> <Yeah>. you know? <laughs> yeah, it's great. And isn't it great that music can do that? Music and movies. Oh, yeah. You know, it's just such a highly creative expression, music and, and creating a movie. I mean, that, that people can create something that seems to be aggressive and some people misunderstand is promoting violence and promoting aggression actually does the, does the opposite. It's the exact opposite. Yeah. 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 yeah even good. some of the, some singers from bands have stated that they have like anger issues, but then they go on that stage and just scream out the lyrics and after the show they're, they're back to being happy again, you know? Oh yeah, man. Yeah. I'm a firm believer in, in, in the, um, the subliminal texts of, of, of art and music and entertainment, because, you know, what you see, there's so many layers in movies and so many layers in music, right? So if you just take it on appearance and don't allow yourself to experience deeper levels of it, you're going to miss the beauty. But if, when you're really into something, whether it's heavy metal, whether it's in a singer songwriters, whether it's no matter what it is, hip hop, you know, no matter what it is, if you allow yourself to experience, if we allow ourselves to experience the deeper levels of it, just like, you know, the writing in, in Halloween 2018 and certainly Halloween Kills, I mean, these guys are addressing social issues. These guys are addressing really important things that are going on in the context of a horror film. So somebody might just see, go, oh, it's a great horror film, but not even get the fact that we're dealing with, you know, alcoholism and familial you know, issues and, you know, uh, trauma and, you know, all, I mean, and Jamie was the perfect embodiment of these, of these issues that, you know, we're dealing with. And, and in, in Halloween Kills, we're going to be dealing with, um, well, we were dealing with other social issues, mob mentality. Like, wow, what a time to talk about that. Right. So, you know, if we work these things out and we get our neocortex operating, I mean, you know, we, when we process with the amygdala, it's all about emotion and, and facts don't matter. What matters is what we feel. And we find a lot of people nowadays operating out of the amygdala. Either they're afraid. Now, it's also the seed of compassion. But most often it's being triggered to, to feel fear. But if we get into our neocortex and we start thinking, you know, rationally, um, and I think that, that intelligently writ films and intelligent music does that. It stimulates the neocortex and then all of a sudden we start thinking like, oh, wait a minute, yeah, yeah, wow, that's cool. Like, that's just like, I saw that last week or my family does that or, or I do that, you know? Right, right. That's when it just reflects on real life in terms of like um, message, the message a film's trying to give, whether it's, it's like the main big message of a movie or like sub messages with characters, like you said, with trauma and uh, Jamie's character. Uh, that's, I love it when movies do that. I just love it. Yeah. That. Yeah. I look for that music too. And frankly, I'm bored with music that doesn't somehow give me a little something, you know? And I think, you know, the, the like with music, if it's an expression of the artist's pain or their frustration or their anger or their love or their, or their spirituality, or so, as long as it's a true reflection of something that's inside them, then I've learned something. Oh yeah. Yeah. I love it when they do that. So yeah. I know you're a very uh, creative person. So besides of course the obvious Halloween kills and Halloween ends, do you have any new projects coming up? Well, I have, um, I have a particular project is a coming uh, that I wrote um, and we're dis in discussions right now with a major uh, sports apparel company to finance it. Um, it's a coming of age story of a high school soccer player. And um, so I have, I, I have imbued, been able to imbue this with a lot of issues that, that young um, uh, athletes, really young people are dealing with coming up, you know, the, the generational disparity between understanding what people are going through, um, issues. And this came from, 
uh, I had a mentor named Alan Vince who uh, had a brilliant career as an actor and then he was a director and he directed a little wrestling film called Reversal. And um, he got over a thousand letters. It was a small film, it did well. I mean, he made money, you know, but it wasn't like a big blockbuster. Uh, but he got over a thousand letters from mostly women saying things like, my husband and son haven't spoken in seven years, but after watching your film, my husband and son have a relationship. And, you know, he said to me, he goes, fuck it, shoot me in the head, man. I mean, like, you know, who cares about the money? I've done my job. I made a film that helped improve some people's lives. And so this is the goal that we have with this. And, um, you know, here in America, obviously we have so many sports that good athletes can, you know, drive themselves into, but worldwide, um, football, you know, uh, especially in Europe, right, South America, um, it's, it's massive. And so the opportunity to make some really exciting, you know, athletic footage under the, under the guise of um, stories that bring out the best in humanity and the best in human beings and, and teachable moments, um, we're really excited about it. And actually, we almost had it in, you know, a, a couple of years ago, and I'm realizing how the universe works is so amazing, how the timing can be so perfect because if we get it made this year, then we're going into, you know, World Cup and, you know, I, and I just, so I'm, I'm really stoked about it. I'm really, really, I don't want to limit my, myself to any genre. Really, it's about the expression. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can't limit yourself to just one genre of, of movies, music or anything, really. No, no, man. No. And um, going back to Halloween 2018, obviously, uh, do you have any fond memories from the set? Oh my God, man. I mean, every day, every single day was, was something, you know, beautiful and important. And, um, it's really, well, you know what, man, for the first time in all the years that I've worked, um, my, my mom got to see me work and, you know, she never understood. She, she told me she never really understood why movies cost so much money to make until she saw 120 people working like, you know, like ants on a hill. And then as soon as they yell, you know, action or roll tape, everything stops. And then, you know, like magically. And then as soon as someone yells cut, boom, everybody starts moving again, building, painting, you know, driving thing. I mean, just everything you'd imagine. Um, God, there is, I'd say the most exciting moment I had on Halloween 2018 is a moment the fans didn't get to see. Um, David, the, 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 the original ending that we had, um, and I can't talk about it because David's going to release it when David wants to release it, but it was a really, really special moment, like a really special moment in time where we created the scenario. And, um, and at the end of it, David, um, David like came up to me, and goes, man, that's like, that's like one of my top five movie moments ever. And I was like, dude, that is my top movie moment ever. I mean, so it, it was, it was such a profoundly emotional and it was the very last shot of the very last day. And sadly it didn't really quite fit into what 2018 was about. So we had to reshoot the ending and I'm glad we did because that helped us segue into Halloween kills really beautifully. Um, but you know, man, you get these magic moments when you work with people like David Green and Jamie and, and Andy Matichek and, you know, these guys, these really gifted people who just check their egos at the door. I have never worked with a director like David Green, checking his ego at the door and then just being a full creative. Like, dude, you're in it, you're in it, you're in it. Let's get it done. Let's like, what do you think? You know, like, so there's, it, was, it was filled with special moments, but that last moment was the most special. Awesome. Can't wait to see it, hopefully. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I think he's going to, I think he says he's going to hold it for, for a while and then just kind of release it, you know, years later or, you know, after right. kills or after ends, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, that would be cool to just get like a little extra snippet even after the two films get released. Oh, they're there. And, and it's funny because I was talking to Tim Alverson, the director, the brilliant director, I mean, um, uh, editor. Uh, and he, because he had to call me to get permission to release some things on the uh, Blu-ray, you know, for the special uh kills edition and um and, and there and it's really cool because david and and you know david and ryan and uh, you know malik and those guys are very sensitive to you know the kind of information we want out because if you're getting behind the scenes stuff you want you know everybody has an image of how they want the public to perceive them or so they're very they're very um 
so I, I know there's gonna be some really fun stuff in there, man. There's gonna be some really, really fun stuff on the behind the scenes, the outtakes, you know, um, and, and the uh, Halloween Kills Blu-ray. Awesome, very exciting. Um, and what was your favorite scene to film in Halloween? Uh, I had, I'd say probably two. Um, one, the bathroom scene, because, you know, Bob and Rianne just fought like banshees. And it's so freaking physical. And what people don't realize is when you have a really complicated fight like that, lots of things can go wrong. And not only that, so you've got very specific marks you have to hit. You have to be really, really intense. And then you've got to be aware that camera is and you've got to know your frame lines. So you can't be jumping in and out of the frame. You know, there's, so it's a really, really technical, but you also have to be super, super, you know, emotionally charged and really into it. And, 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 and going to that space where I go to, you know, where going to the space of fear where Rianne had to go to, going to that space where Bob had to go to, to find the courage to fight. And um, initially, um, you know, Bob was like, ah, you know, I, I don't think so. I think we're going to have the stunt double do it. And, and the stunt double was a good stunt double. And he came in and we rehearsed it. And then he came and he goes, no, I want to do it. Man, that dude fought like a wild man, you know? And, and so it was so much fun because it was so violent and so powerful and so physical. And, um, and I was really, really, we were all very, very happy with what, you know, how it came out and how it was edited. And the second one, I have to say on equal footing, but very much different was the end scene in the, uh, the fire. Because, I mean, people don't really realize because I wasn't moving a lot and some people thought it was CGI, which it most definitely was not. I was wearing two Nomex suits soaked in fire retardant gel. So it was cold outside and this gel is freaking cold. And, you know, so it's caked in there. Then I had um, Nomex hood on, you know, uh, uh, Nomex, I mean, I had uh, gel all over. I was completely protected. But the moment, okay, I don't know if, if you've ever been camping and you're, you're or like sitting really close to a fireplace and, you're, and your jeans get really hot, you know, and it's like, it's so hot and you, and you, and you want to move, but you don't want to move because it's cold, but it, you got to move because you're going to get burnt. Right. So yeah. As soon as that explosion happened and the flames wrapped around me, that's how hot it was. So I'm burning all over my body, just like feeling the tinge. And what happens in that situation is you wait for a bite. And the flame's gonna bite you. It's gonna, and when it does, when it bites you, then you got about three to five seconds to get out before your skin will start to burn. So, in order to do that, and also as soon as that flame hit, my eyes are closed, my mouth is closed. As, as soon as I felt it stop wrapping around me, I could start breathing, but I had to breathe like this. <laughs> because if I really took a full breath in, I would burn the epithelial lining of my, of my throat and lungs. So I, had to, so I had to go to a really zen place, like a really very grounded, very centered place, very calm place, hold my character energy in there, be conscious of my breathing. And as soon as I get bit, we did two takes on that. Um, I got bit in the leg once and then I got bit in the neck. And as soon as that happens, I had to back slowly down the stairs and turn off and go to the firefighters who were waiting with CO2. And so for me, that was really special and awesome because it's not often that a human being gets to go to that, you know, half, I mean, I was forced to be that calm and I love living in that space. Yeah. That must've been very exciting to do. Like just getting set on fire with, uh, well, not really getting set on fire, literally like with a light or anything, but like that explosion and stuff that must've been oh, really yeah. intense. It was too. It was so cool, man. It was so uh, cool. It was, it was really freaking awesome. <laughs> yeah. That must've been a cool experience. I, I can totally see why that would be your favorite scene to film? Well, you know, and people were really, um, I mean, a lot of people were really nervous. I mean, I mean, dude, when you're dealing with fire, everything can go wrong. You can't control it. It's a spirit unto itself, man. That fire is gonna do exactly what it wants to do. And so even, you know, we had like 15 firefighters there and special effects. I mean, Heath Hood, the special effects guy is like at the top of the game, but you just don't know. You just don't know. And, and, and so, you know, it makes a lot of people nervous. And, um, and, and, but that's what makes it exciting. And it's really, I mean, you know, David and I talked about it. There could have been more physical movement, you know, but that wasn't true to the character that, you know, was existing inside me. What was true to the character inside me was, you know, like fire flames all around. 
pull in, you know, all, I, all that's in my being is like taking care of business. Right. Yeah. And I, like the um, being set on fire isn't, isn't the worst part I would imagine, but like the breathing, I think that would be, would have been the most intense part for me personally. Well, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, I kind of think like this, if, if I could live my life, like the space I had to go to, to do that, if I could live my life in that space, the Dalai Lama would be calling me for advice. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just so peaceful and quiet and centered and grounded and connected with the universe, you know? It's almost like meditation, would you say? Yes, exactly. Like deep, deep meditation. Wow, that's awesome. You would yeah. never expect that when like having an explosion and fire and, and stuff around you. Yeah, well, you know, you find um, it's interesting because there were studies done on special forces versus regular military guys. And they did brain scans and, um, and you know, uh, uh, biochemistry metrics. And they discovered that like at rest, like a, a normal Army, Navy, Marine guy would be, his heart is, is at rest, his brain, brain, brain waves are normal, his, you know, blood chemistry is normal. But as soon as they're called into combat, cortisol level goes up, heart rate goes up, you know, brain starts like ticking a different way. Well, special forces guys are different. When they're not, at, when they're not on the mission, that's when their heart rate's a little skewed, they're, they're, they're anxious, they're nervous, the cortisol levels are up a little bit. But as soon as they're called into a mission, they drop in. Cortisol levels go away, they're not stressed. Brain chemistry is like completely sharp and aware. Heart rate goes down and relaxes. And that's, so that's kind of like, it's likened to the same thing. It's like when you go into those situations and when, when the shit's really hitting the fan and you get calm, that's what they call special forces. That's why guys, that's why there were so few Navy SEALs and, you know, SAS and, you know, on and on and on. Wow. It's so interesting how, how brains work and stuff. It's insane. Yeah, it is, man. And it's, it's insane. You know, it goes back to, to, to the effect uh, Halloween has had on, so I've gotten letters from people who, um, who experienced deep trauma and were, you know, having this issue or that issue. And they went to, saw, to see the movie and it gave them permission to release their trauma or to release emotion or to begin therapy. Um, you know, so you wouldn't think seeing a horror film would help a traumatized individual but in fact it did and i know because i've got the freaking letters you know what i mean it's it's crazy but it's it's beautiful yeah that's great you know everyone thinks it's just aggressive and only promotes uh promotes aggressive behavior and and killings and stuff the exact opposite yeah yeah it's nice it's nice and i really appreciate the fan you know the fans when this is why it really sucks that i'm not doing the cons right now because I really love meeting the fans and having that interaction and, and being able to talk about the kind of experiences they had because that gives me insight. I, I do what I do. And for me, like when I make a movie, when I do this, especially when I play an intense character like this, I, I experience zero anxiety, zero stress. I'm in, I'm in my place. I'm in the, the, the most, the most balanced centered place I am in my entire life is when I'm doing the work that, you know, I did in Halloween. Um, it's the rest of the, it's the rest of my life that I've got, <laughs> got to deal with craziness and, you know, and, and stress and anxiety and all the other things that everybody else deals with. I mean, not, don't get me wrong. It's, it's really hard work. It's really, people would never understand unless they've done it, how hard it is to make a movie. I mean, how much, I mean, it's hard enough just to get there to be able to make a movie. Right. Once you're making a movie, I mean, people have no concept of how much, how intense it is and how hard everybody works i mean it's it's craziness it's it's i mean people have heart attacks from making movies it's so freaking stressful but you know but but david and and um you know malik and ryan turek and those guys really they put together an amazing crew and so we just operated like a hot knife through butter man we were just like we were just so smooth with each other it was awesome fantastic and that's the way uh, all things uh, should work you would think right <laughs> yeah <laughs> and um can you tell us anything more about halloween kills and halloween ends mm. well i i can't say anything about halloween ends i mean i know i know how it ends <laughs> but um uh except that uh we we were scheduled to shoot this fall 
So it's clearly not going to happen until um, until sometime next year. We'll, we'll probably end up shooting at the beginning of the year, but we we just have to be socially responsible. So you know, we we need to shoot. I mean, again, we have a hundred and some odd people packed together in a small place, constantly interacting. We don't have the luxury of social distancing, um, and hopefully by then we'll have an idea, more of an idea of what's going on with this. Unfortunately, I think um, you know. A lot of institutions and governments were caught off guard. Some were very woefully inept at addressing this issue. So we have to get this under control and understand what we're dealing with before we jeopardize, um, you know, uh, at-risk individuals. But um, Halloween kills, you know, like I mentioned before, it, you know, we, we do deal with mob mentality. Um, we do deal with social issues that. Um, are, you know, once again, I think if you look at the subtlety of the way, you know, Danny and David and Jeff Radley wrote Halloween 2018, um, you know, bringing in these social issues with a level of humor and then, then horror. So there's layers and layers and layers. I think Halloween Kills um, is like Halloween 2018 on steroids. I mean, it's, I, I, I mean, it, it gave me, when I went down to Charleston to sit with David and Tim in the editing room to watch footage, um, it really, I don't like watching myself on screen anyhow, but within seconds, I lost sight of the fact that that was me and I was watching just the footage. I was watching the film and I was like, and I got goosebumps. I mean, it was like, whoa, I mean, whoa, this is, it. and, and I will say, um, I got my ass kicked, man. <laughs> I, 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 I took a freaking beating, you know, like physically took a beating. And it's, you know, I'm in great, I mean, I'm in shape and, you know, and I've done this for a long time. And, um, and I have to say, I worked with incredibly professional stunt guys uh, who were on their mark every single time. Cause we had, we, there's some very, very intricate uh, choreography. And, um, and again, the brilliance of David Gordon Green is going to come out. Um, that guy is hands down the best director I've ever worked with. And I've worked with the likes of, you know, Ron Howard and, and, you know, fellas like that i mean so i've worked with some brilliant directors david gordon green is way at the top of the heap man yeah that must be a good compliment to david that he's um even better than ron howard in your opinion <laughs> well you know his ego is just not caught up in it though man that's the thing i mean i think of it, you know i did say that to him at point at one point and i said you know and i told him i was like man i've never worked with a, a director who checks his ego at the door like you do he solicits and elicits creativity from anywhere on the set like anybody that has an idea you know or now he doesn't suffer fools gladly dude you show up unprepared or you know you you uh no no he's he's he is not going to be easy to work with but he is so open to create and i said that to him and he said he goes well it's like a chorus isn't it? it's like a choir i mean every voice is important and the idea is to get all these voices singing in harmony which he does man he does it starts at the top and he's just He's a kid in a sandbox and he invites you into the sandbox to play. And, and he doesn't own the sandbox. He's just a kid in the sandbox who happens to be the one who, you know, who gets to choose which toys we bring in. So, you know, I mean, he's, I mean, if you've know, seen his stuff and, and here's the thing, you know, he and, and, and Danny McBride have done comedy and Comedy, I think, is one of the highest art forms because comedy only exists where irony exists. And irony exists in clear observation of humanity. So I think more than anybody, comedians have a very clear view of what human beings are, what they're about, what their pathos is, what their fears are, what stupid things humans do. So when you have a clear vision to write good comedy, then you, know, you take guys like this really a good and look at robin williams i think robin williams is a great example like most brilliant community comedian maybe ever but look at his drama like look what that guy created you know when he was just playing deeply dramatic roles um it's because he had such a deep understanding of of the complexity of the human spirit so i think that's david gordon green and he and, and he's just not caught up in it man it's just what he does he sleeps four hours a night he loves to work boom yeah those are uh that's a good way to live. Just work your ass off. <laughs> I think. But he lives on the beach and he gets to walk his kids to school in the sand with their, you know, with bare feet. And I mean, he, you know, he knows how to live his life. And so I respect him a lot. He's, I, I, I consider myself incredibly fortunate to 
have been a, a co-creator with with him. Awesome. Sounds like he's a very uh, very good director. <sighs> yeah, yeah. I, I I really hope he's acknowledged someday by the Academy for his work. Um, oh yeah. The odds the odds of a horror film, you know, I mean, well, Get Out got up there, so you know, you never know. Who knows? Who knows? But uh, I feel like a lot of horror actors and directors are just, just you know, kind of, kind of, not really screwed. Um, but you know, it's harder to get in in like Academy Awards and awards in general with with horror because it's such a it's like I don't not really socially unacceptable, but for some people it is socially unacceptable. You know? Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. And you know, and I think that portends is if you look at the political bodies uh, that govern the United States, Europe, around the world, um, most of these governing bodies are old white men. And, you know, and, and outside of, you know, not making any judgment on any particular group of people, but if you look at any class of people or any group of people, um, uh, they tend to think, people congregate. It's natural for human beings, we're, we're pack animals. So we like, to, we like to run with our packs. And when you have any governing body that is, looks alike, sounds alike, has similar education, similar values, you're going to have a very narrow expression of where they can go and what they can do. When you have a body that is more reflective of a, of a society, then you're going to have a broader sense of how to move forward, what's, what has value. The academy is still a lot of old white people. And, you know, um, I think it's, it, there are more women becoming involved, there are more minorities becoming involved, and as that happens, we're going to see a shift in how the academy views what's good and what's not. Um, there's always going to be politics, there's always going to be somebody who's unhappy. I think by and large, the academy, um, I mean, it's a lot. I, you know, when I, when I vote, um, when I, I mean, I voted for Get Out um, because I thought it was so innovative, and, and um, I, I voted for, uh, I'm not a member of the Academy, um, and I, I am a member though, of the Screen Actors Guild, so I was on the nominating committee, and then, you know, when I voted, when I voted for the Screen Actors Guild Awards, I voted for Get Out on the, um, uh, as the en uh, ensemble, and, you know, because I just thought it was so brilliantly done, um, but I think we're going to, I think, and especially when you have, um, horror films made of the caliber that David Gordon Green made 2018, and then, you know, Halloween Kills, uh, when you have, you know, Jordan making films like Get Out, when you have, you know, when you have these high quality horror films being done, um, I think, I think they, it's going to happen. It's, they, they are going to make their way into the Academy and, and, you know, the British Awards and Cannes and, you know, all these, these prestigious August Awards, um, you know, systems. I, I, it's, it's going to happen because I think the, also the horror audiences are becoming more discerning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, th I feel like there are so many... Um, like indeed, Get Out was a wonderful uh, example of a movie that that really deserved an award. Or um, look at last year's Midsommar. I don't know if you've seen that film, uh, but also wonderful performances and wonderful direction. And in my opinion, it also deserves an award. But I guess because it's horror, it's kind of um, kind of under the radar. Yeah, I, it, and it will be. I think it's like everything else that's happening in our societies right now. I think it's uh, it's just a matter of time. Yeah. You know? Our, our awarenesses as people, and again, you know, I'll go back to it's, you know, your generation is different than my generation. You know, like I'm, I'm 63 years old. So, you know, like, and, and my thought process and my view of the world is maybe a bit unusual for people in my generation. Um, I tend to see things more through the lens of, of you know, I, I have quite a few friends in their, in their 20s. And I mean, like good friends, you know, like friends that I hang out with, friends that I have drinks with. And you know, and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. I, and my oldest friend just recently passed away um, at 98. He was one of the first licensed psychologists in the state of California. His name is Maury Rapkin. He did LSD in the 1950s with Aldous Huxley and Cary Grant. And, you know, so these are the kinds of friends that I draw in. And that transcends age or gender or, you know, or where we're from. Um, and I think that that's where we're headed towards is we're, we're and, and communities like horror communities draw in these kinds of different peoples from different places. And again, I find horror fans to be, by and large, highly intelligent. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, so go to a football game 
and talk to 30 people and go to a horror con and talk to 30 people, guarantee you the IQ level is going to be 40 points difference. <laughs> I, I think I, I agree with that. I would also bet on uh, bet on that. <laughs> <laughs> not to disparage football fans. I'm a football no, fan. Of not course to... not. <laughs> but... Of course not. <laughs> I mean, you can distinguish um, who's like who's like a, a bad person with your brain or, or with your eyes. You know, you got to use your brain to distinguish someone who's who's a good person to a bad person. You know, you can't yeah, use and, your eyes. And that talks about the neocortex because the neocortex is. Um, is really comfortable in ambiguity and shades of gray. So the amygdala thinkers are black and white, right or wrong, good or bad. Oh, he's a bad person. Well, no, everybody has good, good qualities and bad qualities. And the question is, I, in this situation, are these good qualities going to be apparent or are the bad qualities going to be apparent? And if the negative qualities are being apparent, we need to get this, this situation out of it. If, you know what I mean? So we all have, even in politics, you know, in, in, or you know, with films, if in, if you disagree with a politician, I, don't, I can't say I would disagree with 100% of anything that anybody's ever done because there are good ideas that everybody has. The same thing the same with films. It's like, even you take a film that's like not a good film. Uh, Paul Winters and I have talked about this like with Freeway Maniac, my first film. It was his first film, it was my first film. Paul and I just recently talked about this. It's like, we had no idea what we're doing. We had <laughs> no freaking idea what we're doing. But we did it. But we freaking right. did it. And you know what, there, there are, are, there's some good things in the film and there's some funny things because we didn't know what we were doing and there's some things that are like, ooh, wish we could have that, you know, do over on that one. But at the end of the day, I mean, there were, it, people got some entertainment out of it. Um, Paul and I learned a lot and he's winning awards right now with his, the films he's making. Um, he's doing a brilliant job. So, and I, and I hope someday to work with him again too. I mean, he's a, he's a very talented guy. But, you know, so that, but then again, that's the neocortex. The, the, the ambiguity it's okay it's nothing's necessarily 100 percent good or 100 percent bad you know right right for sure i definitely agree with you on that one and um do you keep in touch with some of their cast and crew of uh of the halloween movies oh and yeah yeah definitely absolutely um chris nelson and i uh academy award-winning uh special effects makeup artist and i are in touch a lot a lot we we developed a very close bond but think about it we'll you know First of all, we see the world very in a very similar way. Um, you know, he, he's a high creative. Um, he could have been a professional athlete. I could have been a professional athlete, um, but we chose this. And um, and then Chris and I, like we, we both are very into music. Uh, we both have very similar influences in music and, and some different influences. Uh, but for instance, both of us were influenced early on by David Bowie. So, you know, there's, so every night, I didn't hear, I didn't realize this until recently. So every morning I'd show up to, um, to the makeup trailer and he would ha he'd put on an album and that album would set the tone for the rest of the day. I mean, it, it could be metal, it could be punk, it could be blues, it could be, you know, it, uh, um, it could, be, I, I never knew it was coming. But, and so I was like, dude, you're so intuitive. Like, well, it turns out, and he just told me this a couple weeks ago, um, he would look at the call sheet for the next day and see what scenes were going to shoot and decide what album he was going to play. So he knew what he was doing to me. And then he and I would get into that rhythm. And sometimes we'd talk over it. Sometimes we wouldn't talk at all. We would just listen to the music, you know? And, and um, so he and I have maintained a very close relationship. Uh, Andy uh, Matichek, uh, and I definitely formed a very strong friendship and we stay in touch and talk on the phone. Um, Nick Castle and I are like, like brothers from another mother. I mean, that dude is so funny. He is so funny. <laughs> He's such a good guy. He is like, so Nick and I, um, it's crazy. Nick, Nick, Nick and I get together. We're like two five-year-olds, man. We're just like, we just can't stop laughing, you know? So we stay in touch, we you know, hit each other up, but you know, the text now and again, we talk on the phone. Um, we look forward to hanging out again. And when we do, we usually drink too much wine and <laughs> that's part of it too, man. So yeah, I mean, uh, uh, those guys for sure, more than anybody. And then there's a, a few other, a few other people that I stay in touch with. I'm a little bit Latin, like Leanne and, and uh, Charlie. And there's a few people that I stay in touch with, but you know, you know, it's a good show when you have people that you walk away with friendships that, that last. and these friendships certainly are going to last. That's awesome. 
Yes, yeah, yeah. that's really cool. And uh, just to get back to the music thing, that's such a genius idea to look at like the call sheet of what scene um, is for today, and then um, by that put on some music. So, for example, if there was like a an aggressive kill scene, like say the the bathroom scene, um, what kind of album would he play on that day? You know, that's, it's interesting you ask because sometimes you would think that if it was going to be a high octane, a high octane day that he would play something high octane, but he wouldn't. He plays something like really deep and rich or dark or something, you know, I mean, he, so he was, he, because the way he creates his art, I mean, he's, as an artist, the man is just, I mean, he's so brilliant. So the subtlety in his masks and the, and the, and the prosthetics and the things he creates go so much deeper than the apparent. So, and then sometimes it would be, you know, sometimes it'd be just like exactly what was going to happen that day. Sometimes it would seem like it would be contraindicated, but was actually perfect to set the tone for the internal reality because I'm a very internal actor, you know? So everything I did, everything I did as the shape was driven by my internal reality. I never thought about how to move. I never, I never premeditated anything. Everything was always driven from what's inside. And that started in the morning with, you know, the, the character I'd already created inside me, that started in the morning when Chris put that album on and it would stimulate a certain part of me. So that's the funny thing about music too, is you don't know. I mean, you don't know how it's going to affect me. No. You know? A lot of people think you would become aggressive from heavy metal, but you know, for me personally, I become even happier <laughs> once I listen to it. Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it's definitely, and you know, people just knew like, and they walked in in the morning, it's like, I mean, people can come in and talk and, you know, we're all friendly and everything like that, but don't be fucking with our tunes, man. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you so know, that was a for, really important part of our, of our setup. Right. If someone would have a suggestion like, oh, put on this song, you'd be like, no, this yeah. album for today. <laughs> Not a freaking chance, dude. Plus, you know, Chris Nelson's like, well, he's my height. So he's 6'4", 6'5". Well, he's taller than me, actually. He's, I think he's about 6'5". Good 250. You know, I mean, the dude couldn't play for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He's, I mean, he's, you know, he was, he was a, a great actor. But he ran away from home at like in 10th grade, lied about his age to, uh, moved, to moved to Hollywood, ran away from, his, you know, home, his home in Pittsburgh and um, lied about his age. But because he was so massive, so big, he looked older than he was and he got work in a uh, special effects studio. And so he started working young. I mean, you know, like as a, as a, as a, he knew what he wanted to do. And Halloween, the original Halloween, was one of the major influences in his life. That's why, in fact, when we were doing 2018, one morning we were talking about Halloween and, you know, we we're talking about how lucky we were to be there with, you know, all the talent of people we're working with. And he was like, he looked at me, he goes, this movie is why I do what I do. What we're doing right now is the reason I do what I do. And I was like, me too, man. I mean, you know, like me too, you know? So we were like living in this fantasy world of, of, of joy and happiness and immense brutality. It was amazing. That's so cool that you guys got to get to think together, like similarly with Halloween and how that um, also kind of brought you guys together. Everybody had a Halloween story. Like everybody there, you know, like David Green talks about how he, his parents wouldn't let him watch it. And, um, and so he finally got to stay at a friend's house and they decided to watch it. And the parents had to call his parents say, you better come get him. He's scared. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, you know, he was like, like scared enough to pee his pants. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think he did, but just, you know, he was just so, he was just so crazy. Um, you know, crazy scared by it. And here he is like flash forward making freaking Halloween tournaments. Right. <laughs> That's so interesting. Like yeah. how things can work out in the world. Yeah, there's a pattern to this, man. I mean, you know, I think there's a, a, pro, a through line of probabilities in life. Like you're probably going to meet this person. You're probably going to do this for a living. You're probably going to, it's free choice, you know? But certainly haven't you met friends or, uh, you know, like I've met women in my life who are like, you know, like, I know you. You know, met friends like that too. Like, dude, I know you. I mean, like, okay, so why, you know, there's some reason for us to get together and, and do this, do business, play sports, be friends, be lovers, whatever. And like, you know, I mean, there's, so there's a certain probability list. And, you know, I think it might be interesting 
to look at some deeper level of why we were so influenced by Halloween in 1978 and why we all came together in 2018 to make the 40th anniversary. Right. You know? So interesting. Uh, and what are some of your own favorite horror films? You know, man, I always go back to, because my dad, um, I have six younger brothers, and my dad, you know, he's a big dude, big long arms, you know, and he would put his arms around us and just go, like, we'd all kind of cluster in and we'd watch horror films on Saturday nights. But those are the old school ones, like from the 1930s, you know, and like, even the 1920s, like Nosferatu. So for me, um, the original Frankenstein, it's it, it just hands down, it's hands down my favorite horror film. And, you know, for me, the, the, it set the tone because, you know, like David and, and, and Jeff and, and Danny's writing, there's so many nuances in that film and there's so much human emotion in that film and there's, and there's so much potential joy and tragedy. And, you know, so that film really deeply affected me as a kid. And, and so that will always be my go-to. Um, there are lots of fun, like, you know, the living dead films are a blast. And, you know, so I, I have various levels of appreciation for various films. Um, you know, I, I, I think the, um, I think what happened after Halloween in, in 1978, when you had the advent of all these, you know, then you had Nightmare on Aim Street, which I think were, you know, was a brilliant film. And, you know, then you had all Leatherface and all this other kind of stuff coming up. Lots of fun, you know, lots of fun. Um, but I have to say the original Halloween to the 78, because I, 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 was an, I was an undergrad, I was in college. And I, um, I, there's two films when I was in, in undergrad that I saw. I knew in fourth grade I was going to make films. So I've always watched films with a, with a very clear eye as to what I was appreciating. How is this done? How is that effective? As much as I could understand um, at a various age. But I walked out of Rocky, you know, the film Rocky going, oh, dude, this is a game changer. And I walked out of the film, you know, Halloween for, in a theater. I had a date. I don't even remember her name. I don't even remember what she looks like. <laughs> I do remember being in that theater, though. And I remember seeing Halloween and walking out going, dude, this is a game changer. Like, there's something different about this. And, and, I, and so that will always be cemented in my mind, you know. I, I mean, I appreciate all the other films, but I can't tell you where I saw Nightmare on Elm Street. I can't tell you where I saw Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I mean, if I thought about it right now, it's so many years ago but I can tell you where I saw Halloween. Yeah, then you know it had, had an impact on you. If you know yeah. where you saw it, 30, well, 40 years later, then you- Yeah, were... yeah, yeah. Awesome. And um, if there was any other classic horror character you could play, who would it be? You know, I have, I have this thing about remakes. Um, so I would never want to remake a horror, a horror, another horror film, because when you take, when you take something that someone has created and try to duplicate it, which is what remakes are, um, I, I think you're always going to fall short. Um, you know, so I would, as much as I would love to have played in Nightmare on Elm Street, and I think Robert, Eng but I think Robert England did such an amazing freaking job. I wouldn't, I wouldn't pretend to say I could step into his shoes. It worked out perfectly with Halloween because Nick Castle was 40 years ago. Um, so I'd have to think about it. It would be an old film, possibly. Um, I'd have to really think about that because it, I, I would be more inclined to turn down uh, especially since I've already, since I've already stepped into um, playing Michael Myers, you know, playing the shape 40 years later. And there's a very definite spiritual passing the torch that Nick and I experienced together. And, you know, somehow the symbiosis between what he created and what I embodied was a, enabled me to, to do what I did in, in a way that, you know, seems to have worked for, for a lot of people. Um, I, would have to look at what was offered to me and and you know i haven't really thought about it because yeah i hate to be i hate to be so non-committal here but, <laughs> you know no worries yeah it's it's um because you know like even with the character of michael myers i haven't processed it like it's it's a non-linear reality to me i don't think about it 
I'm, and I know, and you know, people say, well, is he the embodiment of evil is, you know, I don't think about that. I leave that to you guys. Like all I do is embody an energy and allow that to do what it does through my body, which has been trained over, you know, over 35 years of, of acting experience, to, you know, acting and stunt experience to, to then project that out into, you know, in front of the camera. Um, I, I, I guess I would have to defer to the universe and go, well, if the universe wants me to play another character, um, it'll bring it to me, you know? Awesome. I, would, I, I would actually much prefer to be able to, to originate another, because what, all right, so my, um, my spirit guide and, and um, one of my favorite actors of all time is a man named Basil Rathbone. Um, Basil Rathbone was a good guy, you know, occasionally, but most often he was the highest paid bad guy in Hollywood for like 20 or 30 years. And he did tons and tons and tons of movies and was always a snarling, sniveling, murdering, you know, but a very dashing, eloquent. So if I had the choice, I would want to play a character like his that's refined and genteel, but just vicious and cold, you know. Awesome. Yeah, I, th I think I, in a way, agree with you on remakes. Um, for example, I really dislike the Nightmare on Elm Street remake or, uh, you know, stuff like that, where it's basically just the first movie. Like, a lot of things are just similar. Right. Um, but I think there are lots more potential, especially with horror, because, you know, when you tell a tale at a campfire site, or well, you hear a campfire tale because you're at a campfire. Someone tells like a, a dark story and you take that story and you uh, a few years later, you go on a, you have a campfire again and you remember that story slightly and you retell the tale, but you have your own twist and turns and characters and stuff. I think that's what a remake should be where it has different twists and turns and just a lot of differences from what was told at the original campsite you know what i mean right right well i think that's what you know um, the rough house and blumhouse guys did so well with halloween 2018 was they took what had been created and just built on it you know yeah it was a natural progression yeah it wasn't forced in any way or something and i also think passion is definitely important which really shows with halloween 2018 um it's not made just for the money you know which a lot of remakes just use the name for money, um, but there's no passion to it. And especially like Halloween 2018, um, you, can, you can tell that there's a lot of passion behind it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Everybody was there. Everyone was there because they wanted to be there. And I think part of it too, in, in, in all fairness, um, it's a minor miracle when a film is made, even a really bad film. Like, even if it's a really bad film, everybody who worked on that film did the best they could with whatever talent they had, whatever resources they had available, sometimes which is not very much. Um, so I would, never, I would never disparage any film, you know, because unless it were just so filled with hate and, and racism and, you know, I, I can't buy into that crap. But, um, but as far as someone making a film or a group of people making a film, it's like, look, man, you, you laid it out there. You did it. You know, so I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I mean, it might not be people I'd want to work with because I don't necessarily jive with their view of things or you know their. I mean, how they exhibit their creativity. But I, I would. I think understanding that it's so difficult to make a film. That's why to me it's so special when you when you work with people like David and Danny and you know, um, and, and Jamie and you know uh, who are really, really good at what they do and who just, you know, and, and who, it's like anything. It's like, you know, it starts at the top and the people they choose, I mean, the script supervisor and, you know, you know sound and editing and all these things. And when you have really talented people who draw in really talented people who have the passion that you're talking about, you know, talent, but talent without passion is boring, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, but you can even have marginal talent and high passion and it can be pretty freaking exciting. But when you have high talent and high passion, you get 2018. And t I'm gonna tell I promise you, man, Halloween Kills is gonna be freaking crazy, crazy powerful. It's beautiful. Oh yeah, I'm so excited for that one. Especially, I watched this live stream just a couple of, um, a couple of weeks, I, I think a week ago or something, John Carpenter went live and, um, 
he basically said Halloween Kills is the quintessential slasher film. So I'm very excited. That, that quote made me really excited. Well, not many people have seen it. Um, but amongst the people who have seen it, um, and it's very closely guarded, of course, um, a lot of the conjecture is it's better than 2018. 2018 so, was awesome. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, it's hard for me to be a complete judge of something that I'm involved in, you know. But and and I'm and I'm not a self promoter. It's not I, I I'm not I'm not that impressed with myself. So you know, <laughs> for me, you know, that's why I don't really care to watch my the work I do. But I do the work I do because I love doing the work I do. You know, it's it's not because I like watching myself. And and uh, I don't have any mirrors in my bedroom, man. I mean, you know, I'm like you know, the only mirrors in my house are in in, in my bathroom where I can shave. You know, it's like right. <laughs> I have mirrors all over the house, and you know, like I'm not looking at myself every day, and you know, so. Yeah, I, I, I mean, and just working on it too. When we were working on 2018, everybody knew that we had something special. And we had this palpable sense every day to like, we're, there's something special is happening here. Same thing as on Halloween Kills. Like we, we all, not only knew we had something special, but we knew how to do it. Like the first time we were all figuring each other out. Second time around, we know exactly what we're doing. I mean, we don't even need to talk. We just, you know, I mean, half sentences, quarter sentences, you know, just a nod or a wink or like, we just, we just, our communication was so subliminal because we know each other so well. Very cool. Very cool. And yeah, I definitely agree with you on, um, on not being able to look at yourself because often I hear like, oh, that was a really good interview with, with, you know, some musician from a band or an actor. And I'm, I'm like, really? Because when I look at it myself, I absolutely hate it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I get it, man. It's, I mean, you know, like, okay, so when I work in a film, like I worked in Halloween, like I said, zero stress, zero anxiety. I don't bust a sweat unless I'm physically active. Man, when I have to go in and watch myself in a premiere or something like that, I'm sweating bullets. I just, you know, it's just not, it's not what I'm there for. It's not, it's not why I exist, you know. But, yeah. so, I mean, now, that being said, if I were directing, you know, and myself or directing a film or, or making my own film and I have to watch it from a, from an analytical point of view where I'm going to sit there and go, okay, that worked, that didn't work, that worked, didn't, oh, what we, you know, that's different. I can step outside of myself and do that. But um, yeah, I think it's more important for the fans to, to have their ideas of who these characters are and how they affect them or what they mean. You know, it's really fun to see the fans argue about things, you know, about this and that, you know, and like what this motivation is or why that happened or, you know, why didn't he kill the baby? Was he going to kill the baby? You know, I mean, that's, yeah, I just love to watch the, the conversations unfold. Oh yeah. It's very interesting. You know, especially if you work on that film and then see, see like different things you never thought people would discuss about being discussed. That must be, um, that must really feel like it paid off the hard work. It does, man. And, but you don't really, uh, and, and Nick and I are both kind of like perplexed by this, why so many people think that, still think that he was the shape and I was a stunt double, you know, and there's still people, <laughs> and, and it's like, and, and Universal and Blumhouse like was laying that crap out until Nick and I both talked to Universal and said, yeah, come on, man, you know, let's stop this. It's not, it's not respectful to Nick, it's not respectful to me. And then they, they stopped that line. But because of that, there are so many fans who, still think whoa so nick castle taught you how to move no he didn't um you his what was it like being a stunt double like i wasn't a stunt double i'm in every scene you know so there's still that misinformation going around that um we're still kind of dealing with and it, i mean it's funny i mean nick doesn't care i don't care um you know nick is very man have you seen his filmography i mean the films he's written the films he's directed it's a freaking talented guy, man. He's had an amazing career. That guy yeah. is so freaking talented. Oh my God. He's mostly remembered for Halloween, but he has done tons of other stuff, which is oh, yeah. pretty Master surprising. Writer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would love, I would love to see him do, uh, um, like, like we did with Halloween, I would love to see him make another Last Starfighter. You know? Oh, yeah. You know? That would be pretty uh, cool. Yeah. I mean, he, and he's still young, man. The guy's, yeah, you know, he's in his seventies, but he's he's got the mind and heart of a fifteen-year-old. You know, he's still a kid. And yeah, he always will be. Those usually are the best kind of people. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Just staying young from inside. 
Until you die. <laughs> and um, of course, Michael Myers is a fearless uh, human being or force of evil. Um, so I was wondering, what scares you? Marriage. <laughs> Seriously, man. <laughs> I've, I've, I've had the benefit of having had some really beautiful women in my life and very special relationships, but um, haven't been married yet, man. I'm, I'm, uh, it, 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 uh, you know that that level of um, commitment. I mean, my life. I've been such a gypsy, and I've had, and because uh, I, I never settled down, and because I don't have kids. Um, I've been able to travel and go to places, you know, experience, you know, deep ayahuasca rituals in the jungles of South America and, and experiences with Native Americans and shaman from the Ukraine. And, you know, like I, I, I've, I've been able to travel and do things and have experiences that most human beings don't get to have. Um, but as I get older and I realize I, part of the issue is, you know, that I have this, I had this fear of marriage and commitment and, so, I mean, seriously, man, I, the thought of getting married, I'm like, uh, uh, okay. You know, physical violence doesn't scare me. Um, I, I get, tend to get really calm in the face of violence. Um, but yeah, and, and so that's, you know, but hey, man, we're all human. We've all got our, we've all got our shit. That happens yeah. to be my catch. <laughs> you know, I'll, uh, I'll get over that fear sooner or later. I even heard yeah. you. What's that? Sorry, what did you say? I said, I'll, I'll get over that fear. I've got a few, few years left on the planet. So, right, right. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. yeah, I heard you got some letters um, asking for for sex with a Michael Myers mask on. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, <laughs> it's and it's and I don't, you know, I think somebody um, somebody who uh, um, had uh, I've been also asked to wear it like in cameo appearances and stuff like that, which is you know, which is totally fine. And 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 one person mistook that I was you know, that I commented on that, you know, wearing masks in the cameo appearances, which I won't do because I won't put the mask on at all for anybody. Um, it's a really deep spiritual place I go to when I put the mask on. Um, and so, you know, when I put that mask on, things happen and I'm not willing to go to that place um, to cheapen it or to lessen it or to block off what happens when I put the mask on. So it's a sacred place to me. I don't put the mask on period. I have my hero mask, you know, right over here on my piano, but um, I will never put it on. I wouldn't put it on for anybody. And, um, you know, so, you know, for, for, uh, for cameos or cosplay or something, I mean, for you know, the cosplaying, you know, during a, a, a con or something like that, no. Um, I have, definitely have women ask, you know, <laughs> ask for me to, to, to put the mask on and, and have sex and it's like, you know, I mean, it's funny. I mean, so I think some people misunderstood that I was uh, disgusted by it or turned off by it, which is not the case at all. I think everybody gets to get their, their freak on, you know, everybody gets to express themselves the way they, you know, unless you're, unless you're causing damage to another living being, like, man, do what you do and have fun. You know I mean? That's, that's your experience, that's your experience, that's your experience. And it's okay for someone to ask too. You know, the women that have asked, I mean, that's, that's fine. Because if they're interested in that, that's fine. And I'm not. So that's fine, too. <laughs> right. You, know? you need I to mean, respect that's... each other's different, uh, different looks upon things. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so hard, you know, when you get these, when you get requests like that, um, you know, people, sometimes people's feelings can be hurt. And, and it's really hard for me sometimes to navigate that because sometimes um, people will misconstrue a response. And um, the simple truth is, I have a lot of love in my heart for everybody, and you know, I and I don't judge people for for some their desires or their 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 fears or their hopes or their dreams, um, you know, because we're all human. And I know in my life that I've had, I've had, I mean, I've got my ass kicked in my life. I mean, I've had some very painful experiences in my life, and they've shaped who I am and where I feel strong and where I feel weak. So I certainly will not judge another human being based on what makes them happy or what brings them pleasure or what their hopes and dreams are i just have to accept it and go hey man you know uh awesome you had that idea and uh no i'm not gonna do it <laughs> right so you wouldn't put a ma um you wouldn't be like putting the mask on because then you're kind of in a mindset of like i'm gonna be filming a scene now um 
But instead of filming a scene, you're like, you're, you take it off and you'll be like, hey, happy birthday, Philip, you know, or something like that for a cameo. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's fair for people to ask for that. I mean, yeah, because of course. Some, some people would, you know. But I've had friends, um, I had, you know, friends on the set of Halloween Kills, my friend Zach Myers, you know, uh, Michael Zachary Myers, the lead guitarist for Shinedown. Um, beautiful human being, a very great friend. Um, but when he came on the set and saw me, in the mask he, and saw me in the window in the mask and he's like right up there, you know, in the video village, which is right close to where we, you know, he's right there. And he was like, oh, man, like that just fucked me up. Uh, another friend, you know, another friend was there on the set and I, because when I have the mask on, I don't talk to anybody. I don't, you know, I, and in between, say I, we have 12 takes on a, on a, on a, on a scene. I just, I'll just quietly step off to the side. I don't speak. I don't take the mask off. Or sometimes I do. Sometimes it's been really long and it's really hot. But even then, I don't talk to people. I just, I stay in my space. Certainly when the mask is on, there's, there's no fucking around. There's no conversation. There's, you know, I'm in that space. And so a couple of friends actually have, have been, and the sets are close. So there's not many people who can get on the set, but there are people close to me, like my family, you know, and they're like, wow, man, like, that's freaky. Like standing next to you with that mask on is freaky. Like, like I, you know, felt chills and felt fear and felt, you know, because the energy that's created, it's like the, it's like a circuit, like, you know, when it comes together. So I want to maintain the sanctity of that because when I show up to makeup on the first day for Halloween ends, I want to be in the same spiritual place I was when I showed up for the first day of makeup in 2018, you know? And so to, to play with it, to, to, I don't want to say denigrate, but to cheapen it by putting it on and off like it's a toy, that's 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 something I can't do, right? And and like the sort of isolation or isolating yourself from uh, the other cast and crew is also very interesting because Michael Myers himself is also isolating from any other human beings around. So it's definitely good to get into that mindset. It's it's just a it's a place. It's a space. It's a it's a it's a it's a beingness. You know, it's it's a nonlinear, totally you know, totally right brain. You know, there's no left brain involved. There's no intellect involved. There's no premeditation involved. There's no thought process involved. It just is. That's perfect. If it goes as organically, organically as that, then it's just perfect. Yeah. Well, it seems to be working so far. Yeah. <laughs> you <can> keep dying. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what do you think hell looks like? Well, I'm, I know this, man. All my friends will be there, so <laughs> it's got to be fun. <laughs> Lots of beer and wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, it's funny because my point of view is, and it's not, first of all, let me say that I honor everyone's perspective of what this human existence is. So I, I have zero desire to influence anybody's thought. My thought process is tends towards the more metaphysical. Um, in fourth grade, when I had all these epiphanies, like I was gonna make movies for a living and I, you know, various things, I um, somehow figured out reincarnation. And so I, and, and no one in my family believed in it when I was raised Catholic and that wasn't part of the, you know, the, the dogma. But um, I've since, you know, grown and learned and studied various traditions and um, some, my sort of cosmic view is that not only have we lived multiple lives on this planet, we've probably lived multiple lives on other planets and other galaxies and even other dimensions. I think the ancient nature of our souls is so vast. So what I see us doing here is being creators in training. Like we're training, you know, this is why we are involved in creative endeavors. Um, because I think as we evolve on some level, we'll become the creator of worlds. There, I believe that there are beings. There's a book called the Arantia book, which I find very fascinating because it breaks down a perspective of what the heavens are or what the hierarchy of spirituality is. And, you know, um, and in those philosophies, there are beings who actually create worlds and create, you know, and so I look at a guy like Chris Nelson, who is creating these, these, you know, these, these characters. Well, you know, flash forward a million years, maybe Chris Nelson is creating an entire species of beings that are going to live on a brand new planet, you know? So for me, I don't, I think hell is, is here. I think, and hell is self-created. 
because we can always choose to release ourselves from fear. We can always choose love. And no matter how horrible the circumstances, war, famine, disease, we can still find joy. We can still find love. We can still serve each other and be there for each other. That's, that's, that's a little bit of heaven. Or we can be stuck in a victim consciousness where life sucks and everybody's picking on us and it's not fair and it's those people and those and not me. That's pure hell. I think when we hate people, when we because of the way they look or the way they act or their socioeconomics or the country they're from or the religion, then you're living in a, you're living in a self-made hell. So um, you know I, I'm 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 living outside in my personal view uh, outside of the duality of right and wrong and good and bad. Um, I think they're, you know, in terms of, um, you know, a very narrow perspective of, you know, are we going to get to heaven? Are we going to get to hell? That's just my point of view. And, you know, I know people who's, you know, including my family members who have points of view that are remarkably different. doesn't matter to me. They're still great people, man. You know? Exactly. You shouldn't judge people by just one different opinion, you know? No, no. Absolutely no. not. I mean, would you judge somebody? You're, so you're a good guitarist. Would you judge somebody else because someone's not? No. You know what I mean? <laughs> no. Would you judge yourself because you, you know, because you can't drive a freaking F1 car as, as fast as, you know, the, the top three drivers? No. I mean, no that's, that's like judging a fish by, um, by his skills to climb a tree. Yeah, you know, yeah, they yeah, can't yeah. do that. Exactly. I think that's, that's like something Einstein said once or something, you know? Like that's the, our school system now judging a fish by climbing a tree or something like that you know yeah yeah well that's okay that brings us back to the earlier part of our conversation why i think we're alive right now at a, at a time and place where um we're going to see the world change rapidly and i really believe it's going to be for the better me too I think the, you know the conversations that are happening now the social even the social unrest it's happening for a reason the um improprieties i have a i have a um a friend who's an astrologer who will never hear of because his clients are so prestigious. Um, he stayed, he's completely under, under radar. But he told me on the morning of 9-11, um, you know, which was, had tremendous impact in this country, you know, um, he predicted exactly what was going to happen. And, you know, and he was very accurate. He's been very accurate with politics. But one of the things he said to me that stuck with me was, he said, watch, over the next 40 to 50 years, everything that lacks integrity on this planet is going to break down. Governments, religions, you know, uh, businesses, personal relationships. So we are entering into the age of Aquarius. We are entering into the age of humanitarianism and enlightenment. So these conversations that we have and the conversations we have with our friends when we're having a pint at you know, a local pub or, um, you know, how we treat our friends, how we look at somebody, uh, an immigrant who someone might look down on and go, wait a minute, that guy is just trying to make a living for his family the same way I am, the same way, you know, and, and, we, and when we understand someone who's afraid of an immigrant, we go, okay, so where's that fear come from? I've been unreasonably fearful of, of this or that. Certainly, maybe I'm unreasonably fearful of marriage. So, you know, <laughs> like, you know, so, um, but this time, so if, if my friend is right over these next 40 or 50 years, and I think we're seeing it, we're seeing it play out right in front of us, the level of people that are being brought down because of lack of integrity. So I'm excited to be alive and I want to stay alive to be 110 or 120. I want to be around long enough to when you're an old man and I can, you know, we can have this conversation 50 years from now and go, you know, man, wasn't that a freaking awesome ride? Yeah. Yeah. You were right. Or your friend was right. And, and yeah, we yeah. discussed it before it happened. Yeah. Maybe I'll get married to 110. That might work. <laughs> Hopefully we'll find a soulmate then. You know, it's, I think we have lots of soulmates. I think that's the thing. Um, I think, honestly, to be honest with you, that was one of the epiphanies I had in, in fourth grade was that I was going to be an older man, get married later in life and have children later in life. And, and as men, we're lucky we can procreate indefinitely as long as we're healthy and strong. And um, it's something I'm interested in. You know, so that, that, there is that potential, potentiality in the future and, you know, in my world. Um, and I'm really not as afraid of it as I used to be. I used to be scared shitless. Now I'm not. Kind of. Uh, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> So do you have any uh, final uh, words for the interview? Uh, well, first, thank you so much, um, Roger. I, I, and I appreciate your diligence in, in making this happen because you know, life has been so crazy for all of us that you know, just getting us together has been. Uh, so I really appreciate you, man. This, is, this has been a lot of fun. And um, 
I'd, I'd encourage the the, uh, the fans to to stay active, like to you know really stay connected to uh, if if you're really interested in seeing where Halloween Kills goes, because you know with with my uh, Instagram and with uh, you know um, Nick and with Ryan Turek and you know because we're going to be um, uh, John Carpenter, we're going to be letting out little bits um, until we release in October 2021, and uh, certainly you know I, maybe after. After the release of 2020, let's, let's plan to do this again, you and I. Um, oh, yeah. But let all the guys know, like, let, let all the fans know that I, I, I truly, genuinely love and appreciate every one of you. And, um, and you know, let's, let's, let's see if we can all operate in a world of gratitude and be grateful that we have these experiences together and that we, you know, we together can create a better, happy, more just world. It's the little things. It's the little things, man. It really is. Really Thank is. you so much for your time. Uh, yeah, absolutely, man. You're pissing me off, Roger.